Well, good morning. Wednesday morning, we are in 2 Chronicles chapters 19, 20 and 21 and reflecting on again uh, this same similar pattern that we have seen through the book of Chronicles and that we had when we were reading through Kings as well of the pattern of Israel and Judah's kings, some who do well and some who do poorly. And we just seem to be going backwards and forwards and really never improving and, and actually seemingly to spiral down and down. The word, though, this morning that struck me as I read through this passage was the word nevertheless. Now, nevertheless is important in the light that these chapters seem to be highlighting for us again the nature of sin. You notice as you come into chapter 21 that Jehoshaphat is interested in appointing justice, judges in order to see justice done. And the reason to do that is because of the nature of God. And so they are going to be ruling and bringing decrees uh, that God would bring and they're to keep in step with him. And you see those careful instructions that are laid out in chapter 19. So much so that uh, the king is very clear that when they do this and they warn the people not to sin against the Lord, otherwise the consequence would be that God's wrath would come upon them. And so then you see this justice rolling out. The very next chapter, we see something of the way in which God provides uh, for his people in this battle. There's uh, three armies mounting against the people uh, of Judah and, uh, and Jehoshaphat calls out to the Lord in prayer, summons all the people, and then you get this uh, wonderful prayer that is prayed, and then God speaks to him. You have God's word delivered in verse 14. The Spirit of the Lord comes um, upon the prophet, and the prophet then says, listen, God is going to bring you victory, constantly being reminded not to be afraid, but to take courage and to move into this battle because the battle belongs to the Lord. In fact, when you come to read through the battle account, you realize that it is entirely dependent on the Lord because as Israel or Judah marches out into that battlefield, God is the one we are told who sets an ambush and one tribe fights against another and is defeated and then the other two turn against each other. And by the time Judah arrives onto the battlefield, everyone who was coming against them has been slain and they are there to pick up the plunder. So much plunder that they can't carry it. And there you see this opposition that had been in front of them. They rely upon God. They trust in him and the battle belongs to the Lord. Now, this has been the chronicle of pattern, esteeming faithfulness to God uh, and showing that when people live like that, they are rewarded. Uh, when people deal truly with sin, then God is the God who brings about victory and uh, the one who brings about justice. Now, all of that would be wonderful. And you think about the reign of Jehoshaphat and you think, well, isn't that tremendous? However, once again, the chronicle doesn't hide uh, the truth of, uh, of all things and tells us that as great as his reign was, he didn't eradicate the worship of the Asherah and the people continued to follow in the ways of their ancestors and did not actually follow in the ways of Abraham and of the faith. And so much so, that when you read to the end of his life, he makes an alliance in order to build with the king of Israel. A fleet of ships will now be able to bring victory even on the waters. And yet God is the one who actually destroys that fleet. And uh, they never are able to trade and nor go to war in any other place. And so you see that Jehoshaphat's life ends. He rests uh, with, his, uh, with his ancestors and his legacy will be lived out through his children. Well, one of his children in particular. And you see that in chapter 21 as Jehoram comes to the throne. And uh, as you read about the establishment of this young man into the kingdom, you wonder, will it go well or poorly? Will he be about justice? Will he be about dependence on God as his father was? And the short answer is absolutely not. In fact, we discover that uh, he established himself firmly in his uh, father's kingdom, verse 4 of chapter 21. What did that mean? Well, you read on. And he put all of his brothers to the sword and the officials of Israel. Here's a way to dominate. Just get rid of all opposition. And then he aligns himself by marriage to the house of Ahab. You could hardly imagine a worse alliance. But here is Judah now marrying in uh, with the other nations. And we see this downward spiral. But then notice verse 7 of chapter 21. Nevertheless. Despite of all the things that we have seen in this chapter, yes, faithfulness to God, a God who will hold his wrath, a God who brings justice, but also a God who deals with sin. And you're about to see this sin being dealt with in the life of Jehoram. And yet he is not about to wipe out this entire line. 
Despite their unfaithfulness, we read those words of chapter 21 and verse 7. Nevertheless, because of the covenant that the Lord had made with David, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. He had promised to maintain a lamp for him and his descendants forever. And it's that idea of a remnant, a lamp, a light that might be flickering ever so dimly at this point in time, but yet God will keep it alight. He will keep this trajectory moving forward because he had promised that he would sustain his people. And we see the ultimate fulfillment of that sustaining when the son of David truly comes and there demonstrates for us the nevertheless of God, that despite our sin and rebellion and rejection, nevertheless, God is a God who does not give us what we deserve. These chapters this morning remind us that God is a God of justice, but they also remind us that God is a God of grace. And it's the nevertheless that shows us the grace of God. And were it not for the nevertheless, then we would not stand. It might be easy to read through these passages and kind of point the finger at the sin of the people then. But what about for us as we think about our need for the nevertheless? A God who does not give us what our sins deserve, but instead lays that upon his son so that his justice and his mercy might be simultaneously met. These are wonderful chapters that remind us of the nature of our God. Oh yes, he will deal uh, absolutely, fully and finally with sin. And you'll see that played out in Jehoram's life. So much so that when you read of his demise and the victories that he fails to achieve, the losses that he suffers, the devastation to his family, and then the terrible afflicting disease in his incurable bowels, so much so that when he dies, there is no funeral, there is no honour. In fact, the last passage in chapter 21 is, uh, is pretty telling, isn't it? Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He passed away to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the king. And yet we will look to an ancestor of this man who will die to great regret when the son of David, the son of God, dies the nevertheless death that we might be set free and that whilst we might deserve death and the wrath of God, we instead receive life because that lamp was lit and the light of the world has come. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace as we come to a chapter that reminds us of the way in which you deal with sin so fully and so finely. We're also reminded that you are the God of great grace. We thank you for the nevertheless that you sustained your promise, that covenant made to David, and you have indeed established your son, a king who would reign forever, the one who is honoured and in whose death we have been given life. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought life and light to this world. And we thank you, Lord, for our Saviour and our Lord. And we pray all this in his name. Amen.